Hello, and welcome back to Dishonored. Time for the last DLC. This is probably my favorite part of the entire game. This last D DLC really ups the ante, and they tried a few different things, and they also paid an homage to a few different things. Kind of like the first game paid homage to the training mission from Thief Gold, or just Thief the Dark Project. But, yeah, it's a little bit more subtle here, and if you don't haven't played those games and you don't know them very well, you might miss them. But they're very good additions to the game, and they fit very well. Fortunately, I can't continue because I haven't started yet. So let's start a new game, shall we? And, of course, because I um, play The Knife of Dunwall, I can just... Um, the only game I have available, which I guess if I have multiple saves, I can choose between the different endings I got. I only have Low Chaos. I don't think Dad would go Low Chaos, but according to his character development, he kind of does. If you see what happens in the game and possibly the sequel. So, let's do Low Chaos, shall we? Oh, yeah. Um, I, I would do harder, but yeah, I, I, yeah, it's just, just for the stealth and the story, so let's go veteran. I definitely am not going novice. I'm not a novice. Um, if I was playing this for myself, I would probably be doing Master Assassin, even though I wouldn't be assassinating. But anyways. You've been ill at ease ever since you assassinated Empress Jessamine Caldwin and aided in the abduction of her daughter, Emily. Yeah, that kind of sums up the last DLC. He knew. The black-eyed bastard knew that when my blade stilled the Empress's heart and delivered her daughter to the Lord Regent's men, everything would fall to pieces. He watched me do it anyway. And now the world's gone mad. Plague grinds the city down. Corruption rots. A mad killer roams the streets by night, seeking revenge. The overseers have stormed my hideout in the flooded district. And I'm in a strange duel with a mad witch named Delilah for the fate of the Empire. I'd say I was being punished, but I know that the world doesn't punish wicked people. We make our choices and take what comes. And the rest is void. I can't say I wasn't warned. Yeah, the outsider wouldn't stop that because he loves the chaos. He thrives on it. The men are recovering well from the attack, but they don't understand the danger they're in. My mother warned me never to make an enemy of a witch. Well, shit. That would be Corvo. Corvo, here to settle our debt. You understand, I won't make this easy for you. Yeah, I'm definitely not going to be killing him. But I don't have powers. Oh, I do. There we go. Yeah, how you doing? You can try to get me? Give me your booty. Hey, what's in here? I don't have my own key. What the hell? Do you mind not shooting me, please? Okay, fine. I'm out here. Yeet. All right. I don't know if I could just knock him out. I also have to remember he can teleport as well. But obviously, this is kind of... Actually, can I read that? This is kind of... Okay. This is kind of a dream. And it might very well be a vision from the Outsider, because... Yeah, this is v very reminiscent of what Corvo saw the first time he went in. Where are you? I hate him. Whoop! Oh, nope, oh, that didn't work. Whoop! Excuse me. Okay. I'd like to stand on that, but I don't think I'm going to be able to. I hate him. I'm the wrong way now. Can I open this? No. Oh, I can't. Ooh, bed sheets. Don't think I need that right now. Corvo. 
<laughs> I think I might have broke him. Corvo? Hey, how you doing? Are you okay, Corvo? My man? Corvo? Can I just get out killed by him? I'm gonna try to get killed by him. Hey, uh, sorry about the whole killing- Ow! The woman you love thing. Um, I, obviously I could- I should have not done it, but I- I did anyway. I did! <clears throat> yeah, it was just a dream. And I got my key. Hey, how you doing? Wow. I... What is it? Thomas has returned with the information you requested. He's waiting for you below. Up. Thank you. Cobbled bits of bone. I don't remember ever reading this. If I have, I apologize. But this actually sounds interesting. This is an excerpt, expert, an excerpt from a journal covering various occult artifacts. They say my mother was a witch, but the truth, as is often the case, depends on perspective and your place in the world. She relied on poisons made from exotic herbs and the blowfish that live in the reef waters near Pandicia. Her power originated in hallucinogenics, delivered through guile or by force to those who crossed her. There was an unusual intensity in her gaze for certain, but it came from within, not from the outsider. It's what happens to anyone pushed to the absolute edge of sanity and survival, who stays there for years then returns to walk among the sheep in so-called civilized society. My mother was crafty, but if it was anything more than powders, hidden knives, and guile, I never saw it. Like they tell children, some of those truly touched by the black-eyed bastard can move through the space between rooftops like a sparrow. Others command armies of rats or poisonous flies as easy as they wriggle their fingers and toes. The overseers are right to fear us, to warn the common folk to stay near their homes at night and keep their families close. Those who serve me share in some of what I can do, and I suspect it's the same for the Lila Copperspoon's coven. Then there are those who can craft runes and charms. The old woman across town, they call her Granny Rags. She carves and polishes the bones of whales, stringing them together and opening them to the void until they moan like the fever is sick on the cold night. I found a few of her talisman, and with each one I touched, a tiny piece of me departed and settled in with her. What does she gain? A longer life? Some other kind of power I don't understand. The making of such things is beyond me. I've known four people in my time who carried the mark of the outsider, but I've known dozens more who wanted it, who stood at night in stagnant ponds or begged with the dust blowing through graveyards. People who gutted farm animals or burned the flesh of men, thinking it would call forth the void. I met a dying man once who had collected runes and charms for years. He crushed them all into powder, made a paste, and ate them, thinking he could gain whatever magic was in the things. His death was long and painful. I also knew a woman from Karnak who would trade for charms and other bits of whalebone. She cracked them apart and fused them back together, then sold them. I bought one of these corrupted charms that she swore would ch cause sharp metal to break on my skin. And it worked. But each time I did, one of my teeth turned black and fell out. After the third time, I gave it to one of my men. Now when he smiles, it's all bleeding gums. And I wonder what parts inside him are turning black. Sometimes I ask myself, without these gifts, would I be a man to fear? Would I be called the knife of Dunwall? with my name whispered through the markets and the alleyways, the high towers and drawing rooms. I'd like to think so, but it really doesn't matter. As long as I bear this mark, I'll use whatever craft I have to force my will on the world. The harder trick is undoing what I've done. So that's obviously uh, was written by Dowd. We get something else. Um, the, th the thing is, it seems like a lot of the things he does 
is to punish the wicked, the contracts he takes. So he has a a form of justice, although it is skewed. Very well, it might be skewed by the world, but he has rules that he lives by, and he thinks he broke his own rules when he killed Jessamine Caldwin. I wonder if somebody lied to him, told him that she was doing something that she wasn't. I guess we'll never know. The Reclamation of Dunwall. Excerpt from a pamphlet published in response to the plague. Dunwall, the seat of power in the known civilized world, the Empire of the Isles. It is our great capital, and it has been brought low by vermin. The very thought galls. We are faced with the reality that our once great city is in the state of shambles, and the few remaining domiciles in in any habitable condition are the estates of those wealthy enough to ward themselves against that reality. A city cannot continue to thrive, populated by only the upper classes and their cloistered sycophants. Even if the plague were gone tomorrow, in the present state, Dunwall doesn't have enough hardy people of working age to return to the city to everyday function. We must find a way to attract more residents, which requires removing the cloud of fear brought about by the current regime. The Lord Regent and his lackeys are bad for business, my friends. So it falls on us. A plague and a tyrant must be overcome. And after that, we must undertake a third miracle, turning the screws on the obscenely wealthy, forcing them to pay back into the place that has given them their privileged lives. It is the powerful and the fortunate who must pay for the rebuilding of Dunwall, even if the poorest will bear the stones and timbers of reconstruction on their backs. All this must happen for the dormant machine of commerce to restart. Without that, we are all forfeit, and the greatest city of our age will be lost. That actually is pretty much common sense. Even if the the rich aren't going to work, They need to pay for the work to happen and to get people back in here. Otherwise, they'll lose everything just like the poor have. Regency and Emergency Powers In a time of political upheaval, there are provisions in place for a staged transfer of power, designed with three goals in mind. The first is the minimization of incentive for coup. There is no predetermined person or position within the government that is scheduled to take on the mantle of Regency during a time of crisis. Instead, a regent is chosen by parliamentary accord. This serves to avoid promoting a path of derelict ascendancy and to discourage those who would scheme for such a turn of events. It is the assumption of our governing documents that such a legislative body will always have the wisdom to see through would-be usurpers. The second is the assurance of stability for the commons during and after the transitional phase. During an intergym while a regent rules the land, there are categories of law and decrees that cannot be altered without a majority vote from parliament. Thus daily life for the people will not change dramatically when during the time of regency, or shift drastically once a proper heir takes up the throne. Third, and perhaps most important, is that a worthy successor is found. In order to rule out hasty action and maximize stability, there will be no term limit or duration applied to the period of regency. Historically, rash decisions have been greatly contested, resulting in extended political turmoil or outright conflict. When the proper heir is found and the position is filled by someone worthy of the role, all others will fall in and provide their support. Problem with that is there's way too many loopholes. Both the regency... Uh, The Lord Regent being able to extend their term after being put in power, saying that nobody has been found yet. Or, you know, the legislative body that puts him in power can be corrupted. It was. On every account. What do we got here? What is that? A corrupted charm. Corrupted bone charms are powerful bone charms that come with a cost. Locate them like normal bone charms by listening for the song they emit. Or with the boy, you know, whatever. So, what does this one do? Carry on, killer. I need to actually put stuff on. Killing rats gives you some adrenalines. Adrenalines. Adrenalines? Was that it? That doesn't sound like it has a... That sounds like a regular one. Um, okay. Oh, it was... It put it at the bottom, that's why. Vengeance. Build up adrenaline much faster. The penalty is adrenaline takes less time to cool down. 